Good evening. Uh, welcome to Parkside. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm one of the pastors here uh, on staff, and it is my great privilege uh, to gather with you here tonight to hear from God's Word uh, with the words of that hymn ringing in our ears. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. These will be the verses that we'll study together tonight. I'll read aloud and you can follow along starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. James writes this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Father, as we come to your word tonight, we're uh, humbled by the fact that we can sing those words and ask that uh, your Holy Spirit, the living breath of the living God, would uh, speak to us through something as simple as opening up a book and hearing the words of a mere man speak about what this book has to say to us. It's a privilege that brings me to my knees as I stand and attempt to uh, say something worthwhile from uh, what your scripture has to tell us. And it's a great privilege for all of us to stand underneath the, the living word of God as it speaks into uh, the mess of our lives. And we ask God that you would use the word that is preached tonight to change us, to transform us, to convict us of sin and to make us more like your son, Jesus. We thank you, God, that uh, when your word goes out, it doesn't come back void. And so we pray, God, that tonight, that you would make our hearts like uh, that good, fertile soil that receives your word and produces fruit. We ask for your help in all these things, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we study James 4 tonight, uh, this evening, it is uh, kind of out of left field for you that we jump right into the book of James, but uh, for the high school ministry that I lead here at the church and the middle school ministry that Robbie leads, James has been the book we've studied for uh, really the whole course of the school year. One of the things that has been helpful as we've studied this book together as a ministry is we've had one word that has kind of been a thread that runs throughout the book that helps us to take all of James' uh, proverbial sayings and these ideas and these themes and it kind of strings all of them together. The word that we've used as a theme for the book of James is undivided. We've seen that James throughout the course of this book is calling believers to live an undivided life where their belief is completely lined up with their behavior. And uh, spiritual wholeness or the undivided life is the life where uh, we have actions and behaviors and a lifestyle that reflects what we profess to be true about Jesus. And I bring that up tonight because our passage tonight flows out of uh, James' continuing exhortation to live this undivided life. And the opposite of the undivided life that we see throughout the letter is what James refers to as the double-minded or the divided person. 
And if you were listening well, you heard even in these verses that he refers to those that he speaks to as double-minded. And so, to be double-minded is James addressing the people who would be reading this letter almost as those who are sitting on the fence in the Christian life. They're torn between a love of God and a love of the world. It's like their hearts are divided right down the middle and they're trying to give their hearts over both to the God to whom they profess their allegiance and the world with all of the temptations that come along with it. It's an important theme as we jump into this letter because as James goes about very straightforwardly calling believers out throughout the letter for their hypocrisy or double-mindedness, we can see, so in chapter 1, he refers to the double-minded man who wavers between faith and doubt, constantly tossed to and fro. Chapter 2, a double-minded man who comes to church to worship God, yet wavers between worshiping riches and the rich man who walks in with his fancy clothes. And then in chapter 3, we see a double-minded man's words that bless God at one moment and curse other people the next. This is addressed over and over and over again, and it's where we arrive tonight. A double-minded person and their heart, the state of their heart that is revealed through the fights and quarrels that characterize their life. And this passage starts with a compelling question. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It's a good question for 2020 and 2021, isn't it? Living in this, living through this season of life that seems to be increasingly contentious at every turn. I love here in this passage that James jumps right into just assuming that there are fights and quarrels among these Christians. And it's the same for us tonight, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to convince you that we are prone to fights and quarrels, because every single one of us, I'm sure if I ask you, can you think of something that has caused you to fight or quarrel with a loved one, with a church member, with people that you care about in the Christian community? There's quickly a list that comes to mind. So James assumes that there are fights and quarrels, and his task in this passage is to Look at those fights and quarrels, but to then dig deeper and address what lies at the heart of those fights and quarrels. And like a good doctor, he diagnoses something that's wrong with the human heart and the Christian's heart, but yet he then guides us and points us to a solution and a cure. So in these 10 short verses, I think that James goes about uh, diagnosing the problem, getting to the heart of it, uh, showing us what the solution is and showing us how that can be made available to us uh, in four steps. So those four steps will be our four points for tonight, and I'll tell you what they are as we move through this passage. So point number one is what we'll see in verses one through three, and our heading will be the heart of conflict. The heart of conflict. I say that because as James begins this section with the question, what causes fights and what causes quarrels among you, he wants to get to the heart of why we're at conflict with others. I wonder, even if I mention as we live in this contentious time uh, where we're polarized with each other over all sorts of issues, if you can get a little alarmed at the state of the church at this present moment and see the way that we are at many times divided. And you have the honesty to look at Parkside and you go, this has been one of the more divisive times that we've had as a church over all sorts of issues. You can get a little alarmed, but it's passages like these that actually help to ground us and see that, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun. Because uh, this is one of the earliest letters that we have in the New Testament. We see that it's jam-packed with church family dysfunction. We see that they're playing favorites in chapter 2. There's chronic name-calling gossip in chapter 3. There's bitter jealousy and selfish ambition right before this passage. And here we have these fights and quarrels. And this isn't just like a bad egg church that James is writing to. You look at the letters to the Corinthians, you look at the pastoral epistles, you even just look back and just see like Israel throughout the Old Testament. And you see that this story of God's family throughout the whole Bible is that the children are always bickering. 
And so for us tonight, we can fall uh, within a, into this very same category with the awareness that this is where we find ourselves, but also not being too alarmed by it because we know that this is the way that things have always been. It's really not a surprise to any of us, I'm sure, because if I took a quick poll on that question for us tonight, what causes quarrels and fights among you here at Parkside Church, I'm sure that many of us would come up with a list of answers that we would have some of the similar answers. We honestly would answer, we go, okay, politics and masks and vaccines and all sorts of things that we find ourselves constantly riled up about in our hearts, whether, what, no matter what side of those issues you stand on, these are things that have proven to divide us and to cause conflict and quarrels and fights among us. That's no surprise to any single one of us, and it would be naive of us to not just recognize it right here and now. But I wonder that if that was the answer to, your quest, to my question of asking what causes quarrels and fights among you, and those are your answers to the question, I would challenge you to consider that you haven't actually answered my question. Because while those things certainly provide an occasion for our fights and quarrels, they don't actually get to the root cause of why we fight and quarrel. Those things provide the battleground for us to fight and quarrel with one another, but it's not at the heart of why we fight. We have to dig deeper if we want to get to why interpersonal conflict is a part of our lives. I don't often read the King's James Version, but I like it on these verses because I think it's helpful to getting to the bottom of what James is trying to get to. So it says in the King James, it says, from whence comes wars and fightings among, fighting among you? That question, from whence, is seeking a source, a place of origin of these fights. It's trying to, to follow the trail back to where did, where did all of this start in the very first place? Where do these quarrels and fights come from? And the answer in the KJV is, come they not hence, even of your lusts that warn your members. So from whence or from where did these conflicts come? From hence or from here? The lusts that are at war within our hearts. Just as a doctor doesn't just merely identify and deal with symptoms, but traces those symptoms back to their source, James here is identifying that interpersonal conflict is an external symptom of the Christian life that leads back to an internal heart problem in the Christian heart. From whence do our quarrels and fights come? From the very bottom of our hearts. So the problem is located in this, that your passions are at war within you. Or in other words, what is your biggest problem in every single one of the relational problems that you have with other people? And the answer is it's you. What is your biggest problem in all of your relationships? James says the answer is you, and it's me. That's an offensive diagnosis for whoever, each and every single one of us is reading this. And it's an incredibly countercultural diagnosis when we consider the current state of civil, social, political discourse in our country. We live in this culture where every issue is polarized, every opponent is demonized, and to admit that you're wrong at any given point is to admit defeat. Yet the book of James tells us that in every conflict you have with other people, the biggest problem that you have to deal with is you. I wonder if you take a moment just to search your own life and search your own heart and think about the most recent conflict that you've had with another person. Be honest enough to say, did I even consider that I might be the problem? James says that you always are. Let's consider why this is so offensive to us, even as I say it out loud and you hear it right now. 
Maybe we've never considered that we might actually be the problem. But let's look at verses 2 and 3 and honestly evaluate and search your own heart to see if this describes the heart-level dynamics of how your heart operates when you are in the middle of a fight with your spouse, with your coworker, with your neighbor, or with the person who's sitting next to you right now. Verse 2, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Or in other words... You have these frustrated or unmet desires that sit at the very bottom of your heart, that conflict tends to stir up and shake around so that you start to feel these, these, these desires or what the King James Version just says, this strong lust or passion for something that belongs to someone else that drives us to this place of bitter anger towards a brother or a sister that causes us to hate them in such a way that it reflects that murderous anger that Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount. Be honest, in, in your worst fights, can't you just have a real tangible sense of that, that there is this emotional, angry thing that is stirred up inside of you that exists in so many of your conflicts? Verse three, you do not have because you do not ask. Again, self-evaluate. That person with whom you find yourself in conflict with the most Ask the daunting question of how often have I actually, ever actually prayed for that person? And how often do I ask God to intervene in that relationship and to reconcile that relationship? Because rest assured, wherever there is a consistent state of conflict, you can be sure that there is not a consistent state of prayer and petition to God. But you say, oh no, I, I, did, I do pray. I do pray when I get into these quarrels and fights. But then you're also aware that most likely it's that distorted prayer that sees God as some kind of a genie in the bottle that can just fix all of the problems that you bring to him. And you, verse, verse three, the second half, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. It's that prayer that just says, God, give me what I want. Give me what these passions at war within me are just lusting for. It's gifts that disregard the giver. It's that honest, misguided prayer that Augustine prayed in his confessions where he says, Lord, please make me holy. Just not yet. That's how our heart operates on a daily basis. We don't pray and when we do, we pray guided by these passions that are at war within us. Consider this ugly picture that James is painting here and admit that it is the way that our hearts operate on this daily basis. Think about how often it's just so hard to simply apologize when you're so plainly wrong just for the simple fact that it does reveal in that moment I have to say out loud that I am the problem. that thing that I'm able to often hide beneath this external veneer that I put on for other people. I have to admit that I've got this nasty conflict of passions in my heart that steers me in all these directions that I never really even want to go. That's how I feel. I wonder if it's how you feel when you read these verses and you can see your own heart staring back at you. If we are able to admit that that source of conflict is born out of our own hearts, I'll tell you that we are in good company with the Apostle Paul. You know that well-known passage from Romans chapter 7, where uh, Paul talks about this inner conflict, this battle that rages on in his own heart. And he says in verses 18 and 20 of chapter 7 of Romans, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I don't do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. See, brothers and sisters, the heart of our conflict is a conflict that is raging on at the bottom of our hearts. And any of us who are honest enough to search our own hearts, to look in the mirror, and to consider what's going on beneath the surface when we get in fights and quarrels, 
You have to admit that this is true. Now, once we've identified where this true battle is being fought, with James, we dive deeper into exactly why our passions are at war within us. In verses four and five, we'll move to our second point where we see that point one, the heart of our conflict, point two, is our conflict of our hearts. So verses one through three, the heart of conflict. Verse four, the conflict of the heart. James' diagnosis of the heart is followed by an accusation that is leveled in verse four against those whom he describes. He says, you adulterous people. James holds no punches. He says, you adulterous. James, while maintaining his pastoral approach, hits us with this gut punch to these bickering Christians, revealing them to be adulterers in James' estimation of things. Now, this designation picks up on this theme of double-mindedness and has everything to do with why he would choose to call these believers adulterers. At every turn, these believers have found them torn between worldliness and godliness, God's wisdom and world's wisdom, love of God and love of the world. And here in chapter 4, this root problem of double-mindedness and a divided heart is revealed once again. It says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? One of the longest-running shows on TV right now is called The Bachelor. I don't know if you're familiar with this show or not. It's a pretty straightforward concept. There is one bachelor, or bachelorette, and 30 women who come as contestants on this show. And the goal of the show is to have the bachelor, over the course of several weeks, simultaneously date every single one of these women, and slowly and ceremoniously whittle down the group until eventually he finds his wife and his true love. I think they're on season 23 right now, I checked, and it is, uh, it's hard to get a TV show going for that long. And in my estimation, I would say the show hasn't survived this long because it, because it is the model for establishing the foundations of marital faithfulness but rather because it presents to us a train wreck that you cannot help from, but look away from when one guy dates 30 women at the same time. And this concept that one guy would go into this pool of women, this pool of, of suitors, and he would turn to one girl, offer his heart to her, say all the things that a guy says to a girl when he's trying to win her over, and then literally minutes later turn to another girl and give another piece of his heart over to her, and then the same goes on until this man is found divided into a million different pieces. And with every girl that he turns to to woo her over and gain her affection, the moment he turns away, this girl's heart is filled with jealousy and selfish ambition. It's a silly picture of a very serious problem that we have in our lives. How much of the chaos in our lives can we attribute to the fact that our hearts as believers, we owe a monogamous commitment to the, the God, the covenant-loving God who deserves all of our worship and all of our affection and all of our love. That's the God to whom we've committed ourselves but we spend our lives dividing our hearts up into a million little pieces to every other suitor that comes our way. It's the picture of the double-minded person. It's the picture of the person who, who doesn't just, re he doesn't reject God outright. He says, God, you have my time on Sunday. You know what? Even the Sunday evening service. And you know what? I'm gonna go to Bible study on Thursday night. Look at all this time I'm giving God. But then Monday morning, you look at what's going on in your heart and you see that there is this passionate ambition for your work that is nowhere to be found as you consider God's call upon your life to love him by leading your family. And then Tuesday, you wake up and you find yourself more stirred up about some political thing you read in the news than you do about reading your Bible in the morning. And then Wednesday, you find that that screen time on your phone with social media 
just was overwhelmingly disproportionate to the time that you, the five minutes that you spent reading your Bible and praying that morning. Just little pictures of the way that we give our heart over and our affections to all these different sorts of things. And we compare it to the affection, the desires, and the way that our heart is towards God. And it's alarming. It's this functional, spiritual polygamy that puts us at odds with the God who deserves and demands our monogamous commitment to him and him alone. Every single one of us is guilty of this. Second half of verse four, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And we'll find that any time we try and give a piece of ourselves over to something else, in order to do that, we have to turn towards that thing, but necessarily turn our hearts away from God. We see that reflected in 1 John 2, where he writes, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. These things are mutually exclusive. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. You and I quarrel and fight because we have fallen in love with the cares and concerns of the world and our hearts have no room left for the love of the Father. This is bad news. Just as a doctor can look at something that seems to be mild symptoms and then takes those symptoms and traces it back to something that's actually a very serious problem, this is what James is doing here. All of us go, of course people fight. Of course people argue in the Facebook comments. Of course, you look at all these symptoms in your life and you go, what does it say about my heart? What does it say? The things that stir me up and the things that I am most passionate about, the things that emotionally drive me, what does it tell me about what or who I love? So the question is this, are you showing symptoms? Are you honest enough to look at the conflict of your li- in your life and follow those breadcrumbs back to a divided, adulterous heart? You've divided yourself up to a whole variety of things that get love from you, attention from you, energy and worship from you that only God deserves. As this passage holds up a mirror to the ugliness of our hearts, let's now let James turn our attention to the stark contrast that we find in the heart of God. So we have verses one through three, the heart of our conflict, verse four, the conflict of the heart, and now verses five and six, we see the grace of God. Our adulterous hearts, in turning to other things, are now at enmity with God. But what is God's heart towards us? Verse five, scripture tells us that he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell within us. Jealousy is a tough word for us because the things that we're jealous for are things that we want really badly but don't actually belong to us. Whereas when we see the divine jealousy of God, of Yahweh in the Bible, It is a righteous and holy burning jealousy for that which belongs to him and to him alone. So as we see Yahweh yearning jealously for these people that belong to him, we see that it is a covenantal jealousy. It's this rightful yearning for monogamous faithfulness that any one of us would rightly feel towards our spouse. And while our fickle and adulterous and wandering hearts our shifting desires and our commitment to God are constantly waxing and waning, the Bible consistently tells us that God has fixed and set his desire and his affection and his steadfast love on his people. And it never moves. Don't miss that verse five uses emotional language to describe God's heart. So we've been talking about the passions that are at war within our hearts, and now he's talking in a, in a proverbial sense about the passion of God's heart. But don't mix it up with the passions of our heart, because 
we need to be careful not to project our sinful experience and our concept of human emotion on the impassable love of God. But look here at these passions that God feels towards us, what, what they actually mean in terms of his character and the kind of love that he shows towards us. D.A. Carson helpfully says this, Recognize that God's, quote, passions, unlike ours, do not flare up out of control. Our passions change our direction and priorities. They domesticate our will. They control our misery and our happiness, surprising and destroying or establishing our commitments. But God's passions, like everything else in God, are displayed in conjunction with the fullness of all his other perfections. God does not, quotes, fall in love with us. He sets his love on us. And this is the love of God that yearns jealously for any single one of you who belongs to him. And that's what we see here in verse 5. Inexplicably, the heart of God yearns for people like you and me who are the adulterers, who are the wandering, divided people who set our love in every which direction, the unfaithful people of God. And God's steadfast love towards an unfaithful people is basically the story of the whole Bible. You can look throughout the whole Old Testament and just see it as a dominant theme. But consider just for a moment the book of Hosea, where Israel is vividly and provocatively portrayed as this spiritual adulterer. They break their covenant vows and have proven to be these, un, these unfaithful and adulterous people in every sense of the word. And so God has every reason to go, okay, I chose you. We had this covenant. You broke it. I'll move on to another people. But God does the unexplainable. And listen to this yearning, longing, loving, spousal language that that God uses in chapter 11 of Hosea when he speaks of Israel or Ephraim as they're referred to in chapter 11. It says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offering to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they didn't know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. And verse 7, my people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. And here's the yearning of verse 5. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. That is the way that God talks about his covenant people whom he set his love on. And if you're one of his people, that's exactly how the heart of God feels towards you. What a beautiful picture of the steadfast, never-ending, abounding love of God. At every point of Israel's unfaithfulness, this love bubbles over for God's people. And at no point does Israel's sin overcome or put them beyond the reach of God's love. And that's what verse 6 says. Read with me, it says that, He gives more grace, but he gives more grace. Take a moment to just consider exactly what that means after all that we've read so far in these first verses. We've got this diagnosis. We've evaluated the conflicts in our life, and we've traced it back to these messy, ugly hearts that are right in the bottom of who we are. And you can't get around the fact that those symptoms of your heart Reveal that you are, in fact, that double-minded person, that divided heart that gives yourself over to everything and everyone. And maybe you find yourself here tonight and you said, I have torn myself into so many pieces that I can't imagine that God could ever consider even loving me with what I've done and what I've given myself over to. You're fragmented by your frustrated desires. You're at odds with yourself and your heart, with others, and ultimately with God. But God takes all of the sin on that ledger, and verse six applies to you. He says, I have more grace than that. 
my love abounds more than all that sin. There is more love. It's to the most conflicted, divided, selfish, jealous, adulterous one among us that God says, I have more grace than you could ever have sin. This is the heart of God. This is the extent of the love of God toward an adulterous people like you and like me. But he gives more grace. Maybe you sit here tonight and you just says that that is impossible that God could love someone like me. And you're just dominated by guilt and shame and you've just got these things that play over and over in your head of mistakes that you made and things that you've done and it just overwhelms you with guilt. But if you're one of God's children, he says to you, how can I give you up? Those are the words that he speaks to those he set his love on. He never takes it away. It's the God who gives more grace. This is the abundant grace that is to be found in God. And then verses 7 and 10 go on to explain how we can actually experience this grace that is more than all of our sin. Because you see, this grace is available to all, but it is not experienced by all. That's what we'll see in the second half of verse 6. It says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we see here a straightforward contrast between the person who can experience the grace of God and the person who cannot. I think there's a parallel here to what we see in Luke 18 between the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember it's a very simple picture that Jesus paints in telling this story. He says there's two people, and it's two people that are praying. The one, he's a Pharisee, and he stands out in the middle of everybody and he stands up straight and he beats his chest and, 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 and stands up with his chest puffed out and he prays loudly for all to hear and he says, God, I thank you that I am not like all of the other sinners. It's an impressive person. It's a person who's standing up straight, a person who probably looks and sounds pretty good while he's doing it. But in this parable, we see a stark contrast between another man, a tax collector. What is the posture of the tax collector? Well, the, the, the Pharisee is standing up straight. The tax collector stands far off. He can't even look up. He beats his chest, and his face is in the ground. And the only thing that he can just barely mutter is to just say to God, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What a stark contrast of two very different postures and two very different positions to place yourself in. You remember how Jesus ends this parable. He says, which of these men do you think walked away justified? It's the guy with dirt on his face who can barely mutter out a prayer just to beg God for mercy. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This is the position of humble repentance towards God. And it's the way to experience the grace of God. As you consider that tax collector from that parable, I wonder if you'll just glance over verses 7 through 9 and see that his behavior is so similar to what James is describing here. Submitting to God, resisting the devil, drawing near to God, cleansing his hands, purifying his heart. He's weeping and mourning for his sin. I wish I had time to expound each of those statements, all that they deserve, but I hope that just as you consider them all together, you see that it describes the behavior of someone who understands that they are their biggest problem, and the only solution is to be found in a God who is abounding with grace and love for sinners. This is the posture of humility and repentance that we see in verses seven through nine and that we see in the tax collector. See, the tax collector understands that he's his biggest problem and the only way to receive grace is position himself as one who is in desperate need of God and must receive grace from him. Whereas the inflated ego fundamentally cannot submit to God. Because in your warped conception of self, 
You have no need to submit to God because the inflated ego already has everything figured out. As long as I am not desperately aware of my need for God, why would I ever draw near to him? The Pharisee seems to have things pretty well figured out. He'll never cleanse his hands or purify his heart or mourn and weep for sin because he's not got nothing to cleanse. He's got nothing to weep over. He's better than all the sinners. It's a dangerous place to be, to be the Pharisee who prays to God and says, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else because you're missing your biggest problem, and that it's you. Isn't the Pharisee a picture of the double-minded man, the divided person who what they say that they believe, the Bible that they study all day, completely contradicts the self-righteous ethos that dominates all of their behavior? And at Parkside Church, in every instance, in quarrels and fights among us, 10 times out of 10, you will find the heart of a Pharisee, the proud heart of a Pharisee who refuses to be proven wrong, the heart of a Pharisee who assumes the worst about their brother and the best of their own intentions, the heart of a Pharisee who is never able to utter the words, I'm sorry. It's a heart that continues in that miserable cycle of inward conflict to outer conflict because they will never go ask for mercy from the only person that could ever offer it to them because they're convinced that they don't need it. God help us to not have a heart that takes on that posture or takes on that position before God. My daughter Penny, who's three years old, she has a little playhouse in her room. And when I say that it's little, it's like three feet across, two feet deep. Uh, and there's like a little kitchen thing in there that takes up most of the space. And oftentimes when she's playing in there, she'll say, Daddy, come play in my house with me. And now, as you might expect, I'm much larger than my three-year-old daughter. And when she asks that, I usually just kindly suggest, why don't we go play somewhere else where I won't develop long-lasting back problems? But often that conversation back and forth ends with me crawling on hand and knee, stooping down and inching into this tiny little house where I have to contort my body to have a lovely tea party with my daughter, inexplicably fitting my rather large body into a very tiny space. It is physically painful to enter into that little toy house in my daughter's room. But I will crumple myself up a thousand times over in exchange for a tea party with Penny because of how special those times are to me. The kingdom of God is open and available to anybody who seeks to enter into it. But the door into the kingdom of God is very low. And in order to enter the kingdom of God, you need to stoop, and you need to crawl hand and knee, and you need to take on the uncomfortable position of humble repentance towards God. And it's painful, and it's humiliating, and it's something that not a single one of us actually wants to do. We don't want to deflate our egos. We don't want to crumple up our pride. We don't want to make ourselves much smaller than we would like. But you see, the person that refuses to stoop, the person that refuses to crumple their ego, that person cannot enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, cannot experience the grace of God that is freely available to them in Jesus. But you see, just as I find myself willing to enter into that tiny little house and go through the pain of crumpling my body in a place where it shouldn't be, I do that and I suffer through that because of the greater joy that I experience in that time that I spend with my daughter whom I love. And for every single one of us, 
We need to take the painful process of positioning ourselves in humble repentance and humility towards God with a larger view of how wonderful and never-ending and abounding the experience of the grace of God for us is on the other side. Humility is painful, but it is so worth it. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Endure the discomfort of humility for the greater joy of experiencing God's grace. It's painful. Submit to God. To submit to God, it's gonna feel like dying to the prideful heart. Resist the devil, you have to loosen your grip on all of those sins that you secretly cherish and love. You've gotta let go of them and run to the Father. It's painful. None of us wants to do it. But if we do, and we can experience the grace of God, when we draw near to God and know what it means to actually have him draw near to us, There's no comparison to the cheap and vain satisfaction of trying to hold on to pride and hold on to sin. And this is the way of Jesus. Philippians 2, he was in the form of God, but he emptied himself, he humbled himself, he crumpled himself into the form of a servant. He lowers himself and he stoops to the point of death, death on a cross. But why? What what does Philippians 2 tell us? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. And so as we are called to do this impossible task, we follow the one person the undivided man, Jesus, who goes before us and does it for us. And as we depend on him and rely on him, we take on the mind of Christ as Philippian tells us to, and our double-mindedness will increasingly be drawn together into the single-minded devotion of Jesus and his love for the Father. That's the promise for each and every single one of us that we're gonna become more like the undivided man, Jesus. In the midst of our conflicts, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Humility, repentance. It's impossible without God's help. But Jesus did it for us. In the midst of our fights and quarrels, if we do this, we'll increasingly find ourselves foregoing the vain satisfaction of proving ourselves right and experience the deep satisfaction of the grace of God. Father, we ask that this call to look at the conflict in our lives, evaluate the conflict that we have with you in our hearts, see the grace that is available in the love that you've set upon us, and then position ourselves in humble repentance towards you. It is a beautiful picture, in short, of the gospel and who Jesus is and what he's done for us. I pray that you would do um, the miracle of changing our hearts and helping us to do this. I pray, God, that you would be the one to humble us. I pray, God, that if there's somebody in this room who's never stooped low enough, who's never actually even considered Uh, humbly repenting and asking you for the mercy that's freely available to them. I pray that tonight would be the night that they do that. That they would go through the painful process of humility and repentance, but for the first time they would experience the grace of our God who set his love upon us. God, help us to feel these things at the very bottom of our heart as we sing this last song. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.